her towering statue draws near Goliath riders. Let down by a seat post that won't stay secured. The tight body flows through trails like water. Interrupted by low ground clearance that will kiss too many obstacles. Supple cheeks cushion the ride. Where the rigamortis suspension puts on way too much makeup. Without help, she can push hard for over 30 miles. But will complain the entire trip. Her aggressive looks and top speed will tempt the adventurous while lacking motivation when the going gets tough. It's heck on the road right there. It's going to be a little tricky. That's full power. Yeah. Fat bikes, two wheel drive, or just don't bother. I mean, it have to be one hell of a rear motor, but still, you don't get the maneuvering benefits from the front wheel. So. Some queens age better than others. This is my 700 mile review of the Identity Crisis, <coughs> sorry, the X26 from Ingwe. Welcome back riders, we're going to discuss how well the X26 has held up over 700 miles. In my first impressions of this bike, link in the description, you would have noticed that I was more confused than concerned. The bike has so many odd characteristics about it and weird design choices that I'm wondering how much testing actually went into it. Personally, this model feels more like a prototype than a finished product. Granted, most of what I'm going to talk about on this bike doesn't really matter if you like what you see. I will say, the bike hasn't failed in any catastrophic fashion, and it's held up pretty good except for one minor detail which we'll get into in a moment. I would be tempted to say that I could appreciate what Ingwe was going for on the X26 if I knew what that was. I kind of get the feeling Ingwe's just throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks, and for example, they have their Engine Pro, which is one of the best bikes I've ever reviewed on the channel, their M20, which ironically is terrible at being a bike, but an absolute blast to ride as a two-wheeled vehicle with the cafe-style setup, and then there's this. A bike that's different simply for the sake of being different. Now I can understand variety and how this might appeal to someone who doesn't want a bike which looks like every other bike, but I can't imagine who's looking for this. A massive frame that somehow has the lowest ground clearance out of anything I've tested, and is folding for some reason, as if you're going to fit this in a tight storage space, yeah right, and has a questionable triple rear suspension that manages to perform less than standard swing arm setups. Being unique certainly has its place, but if you don't offer something better than your competition, how much meaning does that really have? Alright, so enough theory crafting, let's get into the review. Their outside of the box thinking with the main battery pack being the actual seat post also required outside of the box thinking when it came to securing it to the frame, which unfortunately they did not. They're using a clamping mechanism, which is proprietary, so good luck replacing this. And it does not hold the pack secure, which means the moment you get under rough riding conditions, no matter how tight I crank down on this, it will not hold its position and just sinks down. I find this extra unfortunate since I was finally able to adjust my handlebars just right to make this bike's pedaling efficiency better than it was out of the box. But with the seat post sinking down into the frame, eh, none of that means anything. I even found the lock on the seat post clamp to be a pain to work with. It's cheap quality, sometimes just spins around in circles without unlocking, and the clearance between the key and the battery is so tight, it's tricky to get in there. 
The power switch on the main battery pack is also an unnecessary complication when you consider the bike's internal battery does not have an on-off switch, meaning that it's always active when the bike is turned on. This has led to many rides where I've forgotten to hit the button hidden under the seat to turn on the main pack and drain the internal pack first, which might not sound like a big deal, but the bike's internal booster pack is a range extender not intended to take the full load of the motor at only 10 amp hours. So I'm sure I've put unnecessary stress on this pack many times simply because I forgot to turn on the main one. You might call that my fault, but if it wasn't designed this way, I wouldn't have forgotten it. The fitment of the internal booster pack is also an issue, a pretty big one too, as it's already broken the mounting plate for the battery itself, causing it to rattle around inside the frame. There's plenty of space between the pack and the frame, and where you would think you could add some padding, unfortunately the hole where you slide the battery in is narrower than the actual frame itself, so nothing other than the battery fits through the entrance with plenty of room on the inside. The best way I could get around this was to stuff some foam into the frame until the battery would push up against the foam and rattle less. But I wasn't able to fix it completely simply because without a Dremel I can't open up this hole enough to get in there and that's not something I feel like doing. To new electric bike owners or somebody in the market you might not realize how big of a deal this is but electric bike fires caused by damaged batteries is a big deal these need to be protected at all costs and this should have been a priority on this frame. So if you are interested in this bike by the end of the video I wouldn't bother getting the booster pack. The bike actually makes for a really good cruiser as it's fairly comfortable on smooth roads but this isn't the style of bike I would consider if all I was riding was smooth roads. And that being said without the cruise control option that just makes it more annoying. I've tried every combination of buttons on the display and I even got an icon for cruise control to show up but it never actually did anything. If working as they intended from the factory then the triple rear suspension is a straight up gimmick. The middle shock doesn't do anything, it almost never moves and the rear shocks, which are air coilover shocks, that's nice but they're so stiff out of the box, they don't really do much either, leading this to have less rear suspension than standard swing arm setups with a single shock. Now admittedly when you add a rear passenger the rear suspension is actually wonderful because then it goes to work with the added weight and the rear coilover shocks being directly over the rear seat gives them a nice cushy ride. However I rarely ever carry a passenger and I can't imagine too many other people looking at this bike are concerned with that. But if you are in the market for carrying a passenger this might be a good option because that suspension system works really well in that scenario. However, keep in mind, the bike does not include foot pegs, I had to add these ones myself. Unless I have a specific reason for it, I generally won't compare bikes in different categories. For example, I wouldn't compare a mountain bike to a road bike for obvious reasons. Different styles for different riders. Now the X26 is so unique I'm not sure where to put it, but it's closest to an adventure bike in my opinion, which is most of what I like testing on the channel. I've tested quite a few adventure bikes, but my current top pick recently tested is the two-wheel drive bike from Mooncool, their MC3. If you saw my video on that bike, you would have noted that for adventure style riding, there is no way I'm going back to a single motor bike. The MC3 might be a cookie cutter frame which lacks the unique look of the X26, but in every situation that matters while riding the bike, it outperforms. The traction, torque, and maneuverability benefits you get from a two-wheel drive system make every single motorbike I've tested in the past look really boring. And unfortunately, the X26 suffers from the same lackluster performance. And especially considering that at the time of recording, both of these bikes are the same price, $1400. Where I would say the X26 has a top speed advantage over the MC3, that comes with a catch. The X26 will technically reach 32 miles an hour on flat ground with my 210 pounds, but it's limited to a 3 minute burst, then it goes on cooldown for 5 minutes. And this complication is more of a gimmick in my opinion, I would have preferred the bike just to have been unlocked to the class 3 regulations of 28 miles an hour instead of dealing with buttons and cooldowns. And due to this system, I never use sports mode, so the bike for me is limited to 25 miles an hour of constant cruising. Which isn't bad, it's just not impressive. 
the range of the X26 is pretty good. I found it to get over 30 miles on aggressive throttle only operations. I found it to be a general rule of thumb that with fat bikes, you're looking at about 10 miles per 10 amp hours if you're on just throttle and you're going pretty hard. Obviously you squeeze a lot more out of them if you start pedaling and there are some bikes which are more efficient than others but the rule of thumb is a safe bet. Unfortunately you're not getting anything special with this motor other than that three minute top speed. It's low end performance is really pretty bad. Uh, from a dead stop, unless you're on smooth flat ground, the bike will struggle. It has good mid-range torque, but that's to be expected on most of these bikes. Yet another reason why it's two motors or don't bother because their low end performance is so much better. I will admit, despite the frame's odd design, the X26 has really good handling characteristics. Even when it becomes upset, you would think the high center of gravity would send you into the ground, but it really doesn't. It recovers quite easily from the front tire losing traction. Unfortunately, this being a mountain of a bike, if you do go down, you've got a long way to fall. I'll also hand it to Ingwe when it comes to build quality. Excluding the overlooked issue with the internal battery clearance, this bike is put together pretty well, even with the complications in the rear suspension setup. It handles like a tank and feels very solid over rough terrain. That build quality might be the saving grace of the X26 if you already own one. Yes, it might have some really odd characteristics, but at least it's solid and shouldn't fall apart on you, so customization might help in the long run. Because I've never used alloy wheels of this size, I did have some mild concerns at how well they would hold up, especially considering flex. But at least in my testing, having the crap beaten out of them, they've held up just fine and add to the handling characteristics of the bike, so I like them. Don't get me wrong, on smaller diameter tires like 20 and 24 inch, I like the alloy wheels as they're a major relief when it comes to maintenance. But on these larger diameter tires, I prefer spoke wheels just for the added safety concerns. Alloy wheels don't handle flex and fatigue nearly as well as spoked, and if you've ever had one explode on you unexpectedly, you'll never go back. The color display is nice to look at on overcast days, but really difficult to see in direct sunlight, which is why I prefer liquid crystal. But the USB charging port has come in handy many times. To sum up my review of the X26 from Ingwe, the bike lacks power to back up its aggressive looks. Outside of the bike's unique looks and comfort for a rear passenger, it really offers nothing better than anything else I've tested. Its internal battery bay needs to be reworked completely to secure that pack. They need to either cap the bike at a top speed of 28 miles an hour or just go all out and remove the gimmicky time limit on 32. It really needs a two-wheel drive option to keep it in the game. And the locking mechanism for the seat post slash battery pack needs to be reworked completely to keep this in position. But all of that said, at the end of the day, outside of my issue with the internal booster pack, this bike has given me no issues. It's very solid and will probably last the lifetime of its owner. If you're somebody in the market for a very large bike, not afraid to customize it to work around its little issues, this might be the bike for you. But for me, it's definitely not my pick. It's overly complicated and has anemic performance. Ingwe has a lot of bikes in different categories, so don't let the X26 skew your outlook on their other options. Their Engine Pro is one of the best I've tested, and their M20, if you like cafe style bikes, has a lot of room for customization. But they tried something different with the X26 and it did not work out. This one's a flop. So I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained.